I have just two items uh, for all of you at the top. Uh, tomorrow at noon, Secretary Kerry, along with five former Secretaries of State, Henry Kissinger, James Baker, Madeleine Albright, Colin Powell, and Hillary Rodham Clinton, will participate in the groundbreaking ceremony of the, uh, U for the U.S. United States Diplomacy Center. The center will be a new state-of-the-art museum and education center that will bring the story of American diplomacy to life. The groundbreaking ceremony will be streamed live on <laughs> state.gov. You liked that topper. Uh, Let's see what you think of this one. Acknowledgement. That's an implicit acknowledgement that so far the briefers in this room have failed to bring that story to life. Not a, maybe you failed to <laughs> bring it to life for the American people. That's and this true. provides right. an opportunity. We can all do better. We can all do more. Um, the second item I'd just like to flag is I'd like to welcome a group of outgoing Foreign Service officers in the back who are here as part of their Information Officer Tradecraft course. I'm glad that all of you are here today. I'm sure there will be many topics brought up at the briefing. With that, Matt, welcome back. Outgoing as in they're leaving the country or outgoing that reflects their personalities? Wow, well, there's a lot of humor Both. happening in the front of the room no, today. I think you can interview them after. No, just kidding, don't worry. Um, yeah. Go um, ahead, Matt. Unfortunately, not a lot of humor uh, right now. Um, have you seen this uh, purported video of the beheading of um, Stephen Sala. Well, we, if you have, are you in any position to confirm it? Let me uh, share with you everything I can at this point in time. We've seen reports of a video that purports to be the murder of U.S. citizen Stephen Sotloff by ISIL. The intelligence community will work as quickly as possible to determine its authenticity. If the video is genuine, we are sickened by this brutal act taking the life of another innocent American citizen. Our hearts go out to the Sotloff family, and we will provide more information as it becomes available. I don't have additional information at this point, but go ahead. Uh, well, I don't. I mean, I don't want to waste everyone's time. If you don't, if you really don't have anything else to say about, I really about don't. This. Should we do just a couple and see sure. if there are other relevant? Go ahead, Saeed. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you if you determine the number of Americans that might be. Uh, well, Said, as you know, we don't get into specific numbers uh, for the safety and security of individuals. We've said a few. That continues to be accurate. Then when we lost uh, um, information regarding Sotloff, was, was he alive um, as of last week? What, what was your last information for I him? just don't have any other additional information to provide. Certainly understand the interest. Go ahead. Jen, you said um, you've seen reports. Have you, does the U.S. government actually have the video in its possession, or are you just citing media reports? Well, the video has been out there through many uh, media outlets. That's what I'm referring okay. to. So um, the authentication process has begun. Well, this is obviously a process that would have to be undergone by uh, our intelligence community. I don't know if it's officially started, but obviously in any case, uh, that would be happening rapidly. Just to, uh, to, to tech, tech, do you know when you were made aware of this? Was it before this uh, extremist monitoring group put it put it put it out, or did, do you know if the intel community was aware of it before then? I'm I'm not sure. There's more I'm going to be able to say, Matt. I'm happy to take it and see if there's more we can on that front. Go ahead, James. Right. <clears throat> I will defer to James. Go ahead. Does the Obama administration consider this an act of war? Uh, we certainly, uh, I'm not going to put new labels on it, uh, James. I would say we certainly consider uh, this act, this reported act, the act of uh, the killing of James Foley as a horrific uh, terrorist act uh, that we certainly uh, have, uh, has, has helped, or has not helped to, I should say, has uh, been a, one of the motivating factors in the effort we, to undergo the creation of international coalition to address this threat. So now we have on the books two American journalists beheaded by this group. Is there any doubt on your part or the part of this administration that in fact the United States is at war with ISIS? Well, I think I want to be very careful here, um, just that we have not confirmed through the proper processes, and I just need to restate that as a U.S. speaking on behalf of the U.S. government. I know that wasn't your intention. I'm not going to, again, put new labels on it. I think it's clear that we are concerned about the threat uh, of ISIL to uh, Western interests, to interests in the region. Uh, that's why the Secretary, the President, uh, Secretary Hagel are all going to be uh, working every contact they have to continue to build a coalition to address this threat. Will this event make any difference in our planning vis-a-vis -vis airstrikes against ISIS? 
there are a range of factors, as you know, uh, that are taken into account, uh, including uh, the interests of the United States. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to read out further uh, what the President will be looking at, but certainly we look at a range of factors as those decisions I, are made. I, I just uh, want to try to address this one more Go ahead. One, one more way. A lot of Americans sit at home and they see Americans who are not even combatants but who are journalists being <clears throat> beheaded by this group overseas. And from a sort of common sense point of view, the average American will say to himself, this group is at war with us. Why does our president or our secretary of state not recognize that and say, indeed, we are at war with this group and we will destroy them? Well, I think, first of all, James, our actions speak for our commitment to this. And the president has authorized uh, more than 100 strikes uh, in Iraq, uh, as has been confirmed by the Department of Defense. Uh, there are a range of reasons, but part of it is to take on the threat of ISIL. Part of the reason we are leading the effort, and the United States has done more than any country in the world, whether it's humanitarian assistance or other military efforts, uh, to, uh, to take on this threat in Iraq. So I think any American sitting at home uh, should sit and look at the actions that we're taking. I don't think it's a useful exercise to go back and forth about new terms. What's important is what we're doing about it uh, and the, sec the president's authorization, uh, what the secretary will be doing, doing over the next couple of weeks is, is uh, action in that regard. But Jen, I thought that the president's authorization, what he authorized the airstrikes for, was not necessarily to take on the threat by ISIL, except as it relates to the humanitarian situation of the minority communities like the Yazidis and these other, the, 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 the Turkmen community, and then to protect U.S. military and diplomatic personnel and facilities. Not, does, do you, you would argue that that goes to also taking on the threat well, Matt, of ISIL, I think the broader threat that they pose to, to Americans, but also, uh, you know, American civilians, but but Brits, but other nationalities? Well, one, that's only part of what our effort is. But speaking to that particular point, obviously uh, impacting uh, the capabilities of ISIL in Iraq uh, because of the concern we have about humanitarian uh, issues, whether it's uh, Amerli or uh, the communities around Erbil, uh, as well as the national uh, interests of the United States, including the safety and security of American citizens, there certainly is an impact uh, on the capabilities when we take those actions. Oh, okay, fair enough. But those are actions that are being taken taken in Iraq, or what was part of Iraq. Uh, this, I mean, the original, the Foley video, and this one, presumably, it looks similar, I think. Um, I was under the impression that people were generally of the opinion that it was filmed in Syria. Well, Matt, though so, I think, regardless, this is, ISIL has not differentiated between geographic boundaries. That's why, obviously, there are a range of options the President will consider. But we've already taken actions in Iraq uh, to address this threat uh, and to uh, defend uh, United States interests. Right. But as far, but to date, the administration has only, confer, publicly at least, confirmed one operation inside Syria, and that was the rescue Correct. mission. Correct. Yes, right? that's correct. That so, hasn't changed. So the argument that you're taking on the threat of ISIL with the President's authorization for those two specific things, humanitarian and protection of U.S. personnel facilities, would apply only to Iraq at the moment, correct? correct. Not to Syria. That's well. correct, Matt. However, uh, that's only part of our effort, and obviously ISIL and the threat it poses to the region has a trickle-out effect from Iraq, from Syria, from other places. But the second piece, which is also vitally important, is our effort to build an international coalition. A number of countries have taken steps, humanitarian, humanitarian steps, uh, steps to provide military assistance uh, in, in Iraq uh, as a result, and we're going to continue those right. discussions. But, but again, all within Iraq and nothing within Syria, which is where this problem began. Right? I understand, Matt, but and, I also and think... And a lot of people would suggest that the administration's, uh, the president's, uh, reluctance to do more to oppose the mil the extremists in, in in Syria has has has, re has re resulted in this situation I would in what capacity well I mean they became a major fighting force and well when you say this situation into, what are you referring to well I'm referring to the widespread 
criticism in the foreign policy community or whatever, even outside of that community, that not enough was done to fight this threat while it was relatively contained within Syria, and that's why it has mushroomed out. Well, I would disagree with that. And I think there's obviously several components of this, which is why it's a complicated issue. But one is the threat of ISIL has grown and their strength has grown over the last several months. Our assistance has also grown over that course, the course of time to the moderate opposition in Syria, but also to the Iraqi security forces. We've also undergone several efforts over the course of that time to address this threat. So uh, it's not as if our response to this is new. Their growth is, has been uh, increasing over the last several months, as has our assistance and our effort to combat it. Like some people allege that uh, ISIS terrorists themselves have nullified the border between Syria uh, and Iraq. Why, why the holdback? Why uh, is, let's say, their bases in Syria are not being struck? If they themselves have, you know, basically, uh, they say that the, the border ceased to exist. Well, Sayyid, I'm not going to rule options in or off the table. Obviously, the president has the prerogative to make decisions. You're familiar with the fact that there are a range of contingency options. That's always the case. Um, but I'm not going to get ahead of where we are. We've been clear that the geography is not going to limit our options, uh, but there's no new decisions to announce And for you. you mentioned the strikes. Do we have uh, any kind of figure or any kind of data or guide on how much uh, ISIS uh, capabilities have been degraded by these strikes? I don't have any statistics in that regard. Can I have, um, let's go back to the video. Have you been in touch with Mrs. Sotliff's family this morning? Uh, this these reports just came out. I, I would have to check on that, Joe, and see. And uh, did you, uh, I don't know if you saw in the video that they are also threatening to kill a British citizen as well, which they say they're holding. Do you have any information about him? Or I don't have any additional information to provide. If that uh, changes over the course of the afternoon or evening, we're happy to uh, provide and it. And you have you been in contact? I know it's just happening, but have you already been in contact with your counterparts in London on this? Or Well, again, this happened in the last, uh, the reports came out publicly in the last 30 minutes or so. So I would have to check and see if there have been contacts. I'm certain that one of the first calls we would make is, is to the UK, which wouldn't be a surprise. What is the legal authority under which President Obama has launched the more than 100 airstrikes that you just referenced? In Iraq? Well, the Iraqi government has invited the United States in to uh, help them address this threat, and that is the legal authority. And he has reported to the Congress uh, on this subject, has he not? Yep. Under absolutely. what aegis? Under the aegis of what statute? Well, it's the uh, he does war powers uh, authorization or acts every time there is a need to notify Congress. So we have a commander in chief who has launched more than 100 airstrikes at a at a given enemy, who is reporting to the Congress under the aegis of the War Powers Act, who is watching our people beheaded by this enemy, but who, for some reason, feels queasy about the saying that we are in fact at war with this enemy. James, I think I'm not going to put new words into the mouth of the President of the United States. My point is that his actions to authorize these strikes, uh, his effort to send Secretary Kerry, Secretary Hagel, uh, any resource we have in the United States to lead, and lead the building of a coalition, speak to his commitment to taking on this threat. And of course we want to see ISIL destroyed, but that is not an overnight effort. Can I just ask one more thing about the administration's policy, broader thinking on ISIL, ICE slash ISIS, and that is, is it still the administration's position that it is President Assad who is to blame for the growth of this group and its mushrooming? In Syria, yes, and that he's been a magnet for terrorism. That certainly has not changed in our view, uh, okay. our position. Uh, okay. So without Assad there, you're you think that this would have not this, this this would have been different this wouldn't this, this wouldn't have happened i realize you it's a hypothetical and i realize you can't prove a negative but you believe if assad had been gone years ago isil isis would not have gained the foothold the stronghold that it has well clearly matt obviously there are other parts of the region where isil has gained some strength but right. they have been provided with a safe haven uh, that has helped lead to the building of their strength. And, and obviously, the attraction of individuals who have aligned with them uh, has been uh, in part the result of the uh, brutality and the uh, actions the Assad regime has taken. And you believe taken. that safe haven was provided by President Assad? I think is it that, 
you are the president of a country uh, where some of these uh, terrorists. Uh, okay, because his argument and the argument of his allies, the Russians and the Iranians, for example, has been that he has been fighting these people the entire time, and it's not him that's provided a safe haven, but that by supporting the his opponents, you all have made it, you know, turned it into this cauldron of, of, of uh, I don't know what you want to call it, cauldron well, of instability and, and, and extremism. Matt, I think uh, there's a bit of revisionist history there going on when okay. this is an individual who has brutally killed 200,000, almost 200,000 of his own people. And certainly there's been a building of opposition uh, to him over the course of the last several years. Now, the direction that that results in is, of course, we're also concerned about the growth of ISIL. But isn't it true, though, that you know, one of your allies, Turkey, uh, has allowed these fires to go in almost unchecked you know, to, to, to this area and, and, you know, basically congregate and create, you know, this, this kind of force? Is it I, true? I'm not sure what you're referencing, saying if there's a report my, or something okay, that let, you'd let like to send to us. be more direct. You know, Turkey is one of your allies, it's a NATO allies, a strong friend of the United States. Many of these fighters that go into Syria that have morphed into ISIS were actually, have actually come through their, their, their border. We you work don't, closely you with Turkey to address this threat and to also address, uh, work closely on counterterrorism efforts. I don't think I have anything more for you, and I'm not sure. Do you, do you think that Turkey is incapable of controlling its border that has become so porous that they cannot control it? Not at all what I said. Go ahead. Just follow up from last mm -hmm. week. Uh, about the U.S. is asking Turkey to seal the border with Syria. Did you have any kind of response from Turkey or any? I don't have anything new for you on that. Uh, about the global coalition you, mm -hmm. you have been talking about, uh, is there any detail uh, right now uh, how the work of building this coalition is going on? Well, I think uh, it's important for everybody to note that there are already steps that a range of countries have taken to address this threat. Uh, in Iraq, but still, we're talking about the threat of ISIL. Uh, I would give you just a couple of examples, which you're familiar with, but I think it's worth noting. Um, Canada has pledged has to provide humanitarian assistance, including food, hygiene kits, and tents. Australia has also pledged uh, a great deal of money. Australia also was a partner uh, with uh, the United States, France, and the UK on airdropped humanitarian supplies in Amrly. Um, there are a number of countries, including France, uh, who have uh, uh, delivered military equipment to the KRG. So the point I'm making, and obviously there's, I could go on and on, and a range of countries have announced their own efforts, but is that there are a number of countries who are also concerned, share our concern about the threat of ISIL. Uh, we want to engage with them and build a coordinated effort to take on this threat. There are different capabilities different countries will have. It may be humanitarian, it may be military, it may be financial. Uh, but that's what we're undergoing to discuss. NATO is an opportunity to discuss that. The Secretary spent time on the weekend, over the weekend, uh, of course, talking to counterparts and uh, around the world, uh, and that effort will continue. He's also co-hosting a meeting with Secretary Hagel in Wales, and his uh, travel uh, following NATO uh, will be, in the coming weeks, will be also part of this effort. President Obama last week talked about also Sunni forces or Sunni uh, states uh, in the region that can help against the threat of ISIS. Uh, do you have an update on the Sunni forces, including Turkey, uh, on this coalition? I think clearly we're going to be reaching out, and we are already reaching out to a range of countries um, that have a range of backgrounds and populations to address this threat. And this is not only a threat, this is true in Iraq, but true in the region as well, that is uh, facing uh, one sect over another. So uh, I, can, I think it's safe for you to assume that we're reaching, across, uh, reaching out to countries across Europe, across the Arab world, uh, that have a variety of backgrounds. My final question. Uh, there have been a number of commentaries in whether in the Middle East or the, in the U.S., uh, and uh, they are asking that for, for three, four years, the Assad regime and forces have been raping and torturing and killing and barrel bombing, and the ISIS have been killing and doing all this stuff for, for two years, and the Sunni forces and states in the region asking U.S. to build this coalition, uh, but they, they did not get a response, and once uh, these unfortunate incidents are happening uh, to 
uh, U.S. journalists that U.S. comes back and asking for Sunni uh, uh, or s regional states to help build a coalition. Do you, do you see any merits in this criticism? I don't. I think obviously the events of um, that, ha that happened just a couple of weeks ago uh, with the death of James Foley uh, put this on the front pages of newspapers and on the top of news reports around the United States and countries around the world. Uh, we have been undergoing an effort for several months now to build capacities to discuss with our allies and partners. Uh, but the, it, our growing concern about uh, Western passports has also been a motivating factor in working closely with international partners around the world. Go ahead. You have said that this won't happen overnight, that the defeat of ISIS uh, is a long-term commitment. Mm -hmm. Can you assure the American people that President Obama will complete this mission of destroying ISIS before he leaves office? Look, I think, James, obviously destroying ISIL is the goal that not just the United States but many countries around the world have, but I'm not in a position to put a deadline or a timeline on that. We want to do it as quickly as possible, but we're not naive about their capabilities, about the growth of their support, uh, about their efforts around the world. So I'm not going to put a timeline on it. Jen, can I ask, um, you mentioned just now about Western passports, and mm -hmm. earlier this week, uh, British Prime Minister David Cameron said that uh, they were Oh, was it last week? Yeah, sorry, excuse me, coming back up holiday. She was not inaccurate. Uh, was <laughs> that they would, uh, they're looking at possibly temporary suspension of passports for those who, people who've been proven to have gone and fought abroad for these groups in, in Syria or Iraq mm -hmm. or in foreign terrorist organizations. Is this something that, I know you were asked about this previously, but is this something that, um, that the, uh, that the United States would start considering? Is it something that's in, within your remit? Obviously, oh, the State Department hands out passports. The United States, including the State Department, has long had the authority to revoke passports. Obviously, there are different reasons for that, including fraud, but also uh, pending legal charges, which would be more applicable in some of these cases that we're discussing. Clearly, we wouldn't make those decisions on our own. We would make them in coordination with law enforcement authorities. Uh, there are also other capabilities that the United States has, including putting individuals on a no-fly list. Uh, so that, of course, doesn't take place necessarily at all out of the State Department, but these are efforts we work through the interagency on. So I think, obviously, there are a range of steps and ways uh, that we can prevent individuals who uh, pose harm to us uh, from either returning to the United States or uh, being allowed to stay, or not stay, but being allowed to operate uh, as private citizens in the United States, um, and that's we've long had those capabilities. Are there any such maneuvers actually in uh, underway at the moment in the, in the works to revoke post passports from people who you believe to be fighting um, with ISIS, for instance? Well, we've long had those capabilities, um, and we've long been able to implement them. So it's not a new effort mm -hmm. by the United States, but I'm not uh, going to be able to confirm numbers or any specifics. But uh, is there anyone specifically related to, uh, who, for instance, ISIL? who you are in the process, without naming names, because I understand that provides a difficulty for you, but is there anybody who you Those are just currently are not looking details at? details that I can confirm from is, here. Is joining or fighting for a designated terrorist organization a something for which you can automatically lose your passport, you, your passport can be revoked? Is that? Well, we, I, I, again, this is information that we would have to consult with uh, I understand, legal authorities on. It's maybe, not maybe, as black and white as that. It's not? Well, obviously, Matt, in order to confirm specifics, there's more that needs to happen. I'm not going to go much farther down on this, but. Uh, okay, but as far as, well, maybe you could take the question and ask the lawyers if it is possible to revoke someone, a US, the passport of a U.S. citizen or even revoke their citizenship, perhaps, if they join or become a member of or fight for, well, however you want to define it. Um, a foreign terror, uh, an organization that the, that the U.S. government has designated to be a terrorist organization. Well, I, I will check with the lawyers and see if there's more to say. It's unlikely there will be more, but I'm happy to check with them and see. Actually, what I would prefer you to check with the lawyers and see if there's any way an individual, having been confirmed to have gone and fought for an entity designated by our government as a foreign terrorist organization, could somehow be allowed to keep their passport. Well, I think I'd James, be more shocked if they could keep their passport than if it were somehow there, uh, uh, measures could be taken to revoke it. We can revoke passports for a range of reasons. I think revoking one and not allowing them to keep it is a very similar uh, 
term or their synonyms, I guess I should say. Um, I will see if there's more to say. I think it's important for people to understand that the State Department has the prerogative to do that for a range of reasons. There are a broad range of reasons. I will see if there's more we can add. Um, but this is, uh, we're talking about something that's less than an actual, like, you know, a legal conviction uh, of a crime, something for which might be in the statutes or in the regulations. As this an administrative a, matter is what yeah, you're saying. Exactly. Can you go ahead and just do it? Uh, so if one of these guys gets on a plane and wherever uh, and pulls his passport out, they'll say, well, you know, sorry, your passport's been revoked. Well, and they don't I, even know. As I mentioned, broadly happened. speaking, there are also a range of steps we can take, including right. putting individuals on a no-fly list. So every country has different capabilities and different tools at their disposal. Go ahead, Saeed. Uh, I just wanted to move to another topic, the, uh, the raid on the Shabab last night. Uh, the sure. Okay. Can you confirm whether the head of uh, al Shabab Mukhtar Ali Zubair, was killed in that raid? <clears throat> Mukhtar Ali Zubair. Department assets were used in this raid. Um, Said, I don't have uh, any uh, information to confirm uh, at this point in time. Uh, I can tell you, and I think it's worth uh, repeating for all of you, that obviously Al Shabaab was designated as a foreign terrorist organization in 2008. Uh, there, of course, have been efforts underway to take on uh, the threat posed by this group. Uh, we have a range of ways we can do that, um, including designations, but including other actions. Uh, I don't have any more uh, at this point in time to confirm for you, though. Go ahead. Uh, do we have any more on this? Go ahead. Sure. Writ larger, and that is, um, a while ago, there was discussion about reopening the embassy in Mogadishu. Do you have? I think it was having a, a, a representative of the embassy. I'm not sure it was. OK. Well, okay. can you? Look into. I, I realize you probably don't have it there. Sure. But how, 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 what, you know, what's the status of? We will see if there's uh, anything the, more to say on that. Go we'll ahead, and then we'll go to you. Well, let's just go ahead. Can we go to uh, Kazakhstan? No, I have uh, a couple more on Somalia. On Somalia, okay. Uh, we just had a press conference. The operation was carried out on Monday, and saying that it was assessing the results. I mean, are you in the position to be able to give us any details at all about, uh, you know? Not. I mean, I know not you at said this point. That, we had it a no, I know. Not at this point. Nothing Sorry, from here at the podium. More on the, same topic. Mm -hmm. uh, the justification uh, for uh, going after Gurdan was that uh, uh, that he's the leader of Al Shabaab and they're affiliated with Al Qaeda, or uh, that he himself is affiliated with Al Qaeda. Well, both of those. I mean, he is the leader, and uh, both, and he is the. They are affiliated with Al Qaeda, but I'm not going to have anything more to offer for you at this point in time. I hope we will have more over the course of the next 24 hours. Go ahead. Last week, uh, President Putin was attending uh, a youth forum in Russia, and uh, he was asked by one of the students if uh, there was a potential for uh, separatism in the rising uh, r nationalism in Kazakhstan, just like in Ukraine, to which he uh, replied that under the current president, Nursultan Nazarbayev, there is no s such a chance. And he said that, quote, he created a state uh, where there was a no, no, no state, and Kazakhs never had a statehood. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, the, this caused an outrage in Kazakhstan. Uh, and in fact, the president himself actually was quoted saying that uh, he may pull out of the uh, out of the uh, Eurasian Union if the independence of Kazakhstan is under threat. Do you have any comment on that? I, I had not seen those reports. I will see if there's more we have to add. I have another one. OK, Can, go ahead. Um, on August 27th, the California State Senate uh, adopted a resolution uh, calling the federal government to recognize Nagorno-Karabakh. I'm not going to have any comment on this, I promise you. It's a state issue. Yeah, go ahead. Go back to uh, President Putin and um, his comments. Sure. Um, I don't think that anyone in this government yet, in this administration, has commented on these, uh, this, I can be in Kiev in two days. And uh, th those comments. Two weeks. two weeks. Sorry, not two days. Although maybe two days is more accurate. Who knows? Um, in two weeks. So, do you have any? Uh, do you regard these comments by the Russian president as, as provocative? How, how, how do you see these, especially given what's going on um, right now with the Ukrainian allegations that the Russians have actually invaded? Well, this is hardly the language of a statesman seeking peace and prosperity uh, for people. Uh, for people in the region. Uh, I understand that there have been some explanations about language being taken out of context uh, from the Kremlin. I'll let them speak to that. And which uh, should sound familiar to 
denizens of this building who well, have James, seen remarks reported. I think um, it would be more useful, of course, for to hear President Putin say that in two weeks he will remove all Russian troops and uh, pull back the assistance, financial and military, that he's providing to the separatists. Uh, that certainly is our. So opinion. you're giving him two weeks? Is that the deal? Well, I think would you I, like to see it happen I sooner rather two than two weeks? Later. Of course, we'd want it to happen sooner, but uh, the reference to two weeks was uh, in the two weeks. Okay. In the quote. Go Do ahead. you have any reason to doubt any of the allegations being made by the Ukrainians that they're actually now fighting? It's not just it's not just pro, as a you know pro-Russian separatists they're fighting. It is the Russian army itself. And do you have any comments, since you did have a comment on President Putin and his two-week uh, remark, do you have any comment on the Ukrainian defense minister talking about this conflict as the great patriotic war? Well, the first question, Matt, I think Russia has certainly continued to increase its intervention in eastern Ukraine uh, and is responsible for the escalating violence. Uh, we know it's encouraged by Russia, it's funded by Russia, the separatists are trained by Russia. Uh, and obviously the, um, we've seen over the course of the last several weeks uh, an escalating uh, level of aggression uh, from the Russian-backed separatists, and obviously Russia has been fully engaged in that effort. Um, in terms of the uh, specific comments of the defense minister, I'm happy to take a look at them if you want to okay. send them over. Well, do you have, do you have any reason to believe <coughs> that, the, that the Ukrainians are incorrect or, or are correct when they say that Russia has invaded their country? Well, I think we've seen, uh, and I, I don't want to make a sweeping term because there are, there are reports we have that are unconfirmed, and we speak to the ones that we have are, that are more confirmed. Okay. But well, that are more confirmed? That are confirmed. Um, <laughs> so, okay, can you speak? So, speaking to the confirmed reports, are there Russian troops in Ukraine right now fighting the Ukrainian army, as the Ukrainians claim? Well, I think, Matt, I don't have anything new to confirm for you independently from the United States. Obviously, we've seen uh, an increasing uh, level of aggression from the Russians. That includes uh, the, uh, the movement of troops across the border, which NATO and others have certainly spoken to and confirmed over the course of the last week. Uh, that includes continued pro uh, the continued effort to provide military assistance okay. and financing. That means con movement of troops across the mo – movement of Russian troops across the Ukrainian border into Ukraine. Is well, that what you're talking about? Well, that's been confirmed, I mean, uh, last okay, week. Okay. So why is that not an invasion? Why do you – why do you shy away from this? I mean, the, the NATO commander said last week that if this was happening in a NATO member, it would invoke Article – Article 5 would be – <clears throat> excuse me, invoke, because it would be something that it requires a military response. If one member is attacked, they're all attacked. So uh, why not call it the way you see it? Well, I think in our view it doesn't matter what we call it. We're calling it a an illegal incursion. We're saying they're violating the sovereignty of Ukraine. Uh, we've obviously increased not only the number of sanctions and the kind of sanctions we're putting in place, but we continue con to consider a range of requests that the Ukrainians right. have issued. I, so I, our actions, in our view, and what we're going to do about it is more important. All right, than I have what two more it. very, very brief ones. One, well, what do you think then, since you're so, you're convinced that that the Ukrainians and NATO and everyone else is right that there is an incursion that the Russian troops are there? What do you make of the Russian denials that they're not? Well, I think uh, that contradicts the facts on the ground and what we've all seen, not just the United States, but. Uh, a range of countries and certainly NATO, as they've spoken to. Over so, the last week. President Putin and Foreign Minister Lavrov and Ambassador Cherkin and 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 all Russian Defense Ministry people—they're all lying when they say no. We don't have anyone. I'll we let don't you have any put troops. labels on it, but all I right. think the facts are the facts. And then my last one: um, I believe that the Secretary was supposed to swear an Ambassador Teft today. That's correct. Did it happen? Uh, I it was supposed to happen at so. one. I think it was happening as I was preparing to come okay. out here. So, so no given the fact that you've essentially happen. just accused the Russian leadership of not telling the truth and lying, what you know, what what is Ambassador Teft going to Moscow? Well, one, do you know if he's going to be welcomed in Moscow? And two, uh, by the Russians. And two, what's he going to get? What's he going to go there to do? If you if you think that the Russian government as a whole, or at least the top echelons of it, are just lying. Well, Matt, I think uh, it's important to remember here that there are a range of issues we work with Russia on. 
Uh, it's not just Ukraine and our efforts to pursue a diplomatic path forward. Certainly that's one of the issues that the Secretary discusses with Foreign Minister Lavrov, and I expect the Ambassador will certainly as well. And obviously having an Ambassador-level <coughs> uh, diplomat in place is something we think is important uh, in a place uh, like Russia. Uh, but we work with on them. We work with them on other issues, and that will continue, and that will be a part of the dialogue he has as ambassador to the country. Did you see where President Putin, in published remarks, uh, said that he wanted to remind his listeners that Russia is a very powerful nuclear nation? You saw those reported comments. I, I don't think I've seen them, and they happened over the course of the weekend. Uh, of Friday. Okay. Uh, and it was interpreted by. Many, including our colleagues at the Daily Beast, who put a large headline on it, uh, as escalating the situation and a kind of a veiled threat from Mr. Putin that he is prepared to take this localized conflict um, and and uh, inflate it to the level of a nuclear conflict. Uh, is that something that concerns you? Well, uh, there have been a series of escalatory remarks made by President Putin. Um, I don't want to uh, judge or predict what his remark meant. Um, I don't have any assessment of that, so I would ask you to ask them that question. Should we be concerned when the spokesperson for the State Department three days or four days after the President of the Russian Federation invokes uh, the nuclear threat hasn't heard about it? I think I would hardly ascribe it as exactly that, James. I think you are leading to a conclusion about what it meant, but I'm happy to give you a test of what happened over the weekend and see how you do on that test. <laughs> Go ahead, Ali. Um, wait, wait. I don't want to see that. Yeah. Please. <laughs> I'll take it alongside you, Matt. Okay. We'll both we'll do, do it together. Ahead, do it together. The UN Human Rights Office released a report about violence in eastern Ukraine and civilian deaths. They say that between the beginning of the conflict there and mid-August, the civilian death toll is at 2,600. Does the State Department share that, um, that n belief in that number is uh, correct? And is there, do you have any comment on that report? Um, I don't have any verification of the exact numbers, but I will say that obviously the impact on civilian casualties uh, is an area that we certainly are concerned about, and we have been encouraging both sides to uh, take steps to uh, reduce and prevent uh, the deaths of civilians. Obviously, there are certain areas where there is fighting back and forth, and Ukraine is defending the sovereignty of their own country, so that's important context, but we've seen throughout this conflict over the last several months that, unfortunately, there have been civilians who have uh, been victims of, of what's the, of the back and forth. And this report also cites the fact that um, the death toll has increased uh, between uh, – there's now 36 people killed each day in fighting between July – mid-July and mid-August. That's versus 11 people killed a day between mid-May and mid-July. This building has frequently cited the Ukrainian military's restraint in fighting. Uh, is that escalation that the UN report cites an example of restraint being shown by the Ukrainian military? Well, Ali, I think, one, we don't want to see civilian casualties anywhere uh, in uh, Ukraine or any country, uh, of course. Um, and this is a case, though, of the Ukrainian government defending the sovereignty of their own country. Uh, this wouldn't be the case at all if uh, Russian separatists moved out of Ukraine, if Russian – if Russia moved their supplies, their military equipment, their financing out of Ukraine. And I think we have to remember what the source is here. But with that all being said, we certainly continue to encourage both sides uh, to act in a way that reduces the impact on civilians. Jen, have you already been – I'm sorry if you've addressed this already uh, – responded to the uh, idea from President Putin that uh, Kiev um, should be discussing statehood for the uh, rebel eastern um, districts. Um, is this something that wh – where does the United, stand, United States stand on that idea? Well, certainly we support the territorial integrity of Ukraine, as we have from the beginning, and that wouldn't be consistent with that. Um, but it's disingenuous, in our view, for people, uh, including um, the Russians, to uh, – who have ignored a range of proposals by President Poroshenko, uh, including uh, those that would offer greater autonomy. Uh, to be um, uh, putting out new proposals uh, when there can be a discussion about what's been in place and what's been on the table for months now. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. Ukraine related. Going back to the air disaster that a lot of people seem to have forgotten about as it goes off the front pages and off the mm -hmm. top of the news. But what's the latest on the investigation into the MH17 crash? 
I don't have any update for you. I'm happy to check with our team. And Can you check? There had been some discussion from the Dutch, I think, that there was going to be some kind of a preliminary report on the black boxes, what the flight recorders said. I know that's the, first, the next step. In the um, first week of, of this month. I know that's the next step. Let me see if there's any updates on the timing of that coming Do you out. Are you in a position to uh, offer anything, any additional uh, or any additional information or any any additional evidence to, to back up what the U.S. and others have said about the cause of, of the crash? Or is it, are we still in the same place that we were? We're still in the same place. Obviously, we offered a range of information at the time, and as information has become available, we will continue to make okay. that available, but I have nothing does, new to do. Okay. Does that mean, that though, that no new information is going to be forthcoming, or does it mean simply that you're not sure that... I wouldn't draw that conclusion. Obviously, there was a range of information that was rapidly available in the short, in the days following the crash. I'm not aware of new information. I can see right. if there's any more to provide to all of you. Okay. It's just that usually, as you go along in a... As, a, as an investigation progresses, you get more information rather than none. There's also been an investigation ongoing. So well, I'm I understand sure we'll that, but I mean, usually the there's States. more that comes out as it progresses rather than all of a sudden it being shut down and there's nothing. But anyway, your understanding is that the preliminary, the air, the, the, the recording, the cockpit recorders, that's the next. Step. That's my understanding, the initial report. And the timing yes. of it sometime in the first week of that September? That was my understanding. I can see if there's more uh, that we can provide <coughs> in the exact timing. Um, no, go ahead, Leslie. Um, the Europeans have said they're considering additional sanctions, and you kind of pointed to that last week. Mm -hmm. um, how soon would you know, or how soon would you be moving on, on those sanctions? Well, we are discussing uh, with our European allies and al other allies and partners uh, what additional steps uh, we could take. Of course, that includes sanctions, um, but I don't have any uh, prediction for you on the timing or the content of those. So you're not looking at any specific move within the next few, on a, on a timeline, you know, whether Putin moves by a certain certain time uh, or whether the, de I mean, it's, it's it's very obvious this, the tensions are escalating rather than de-escalating. Well, certainly Russia's actions, and if they were to make a decision to de-escalate, would impact and our, our response would be correlated. Um, but, of course, we look at the actions that have been taken, and certainly the actions they may take in the future will impact what we may do in the future. So do you know maybe when the Europeans are considering this? I would point you to then uh, for that. It's a discussion that's ongoing. I expect it will be a big topic at NATO. You and, the United, you and the Europeans have been um, in gridlock, kind of up step, uh, mm -hmm. increasing sanctions over the last few months. And so far, there's been very little to show for it in, in terms of concrete actions on the part of the Russians. They've just continued on the way that they wanted to go. Isn't it really uh, futile to impose a new round of sanctions? Well, I would disagree with that. One, I would say there has been, I know this isn't your exact question, but there has been both immediate impact on capital markets, investment confidence, uh, you know, result in investment uh, investment being canceled or deferred, uh, but there are also longer term implications that certainly deepen over time. Uh, in terms of that, what we mean by that is the isolation of Russia uh, from the international community, uh, the isolation from Russia uh, even through their uh, investments and how they can attract investment from companies. Uh, so. Those are, efforts are ongoing. We still feel this is a very effective tool to use and to continue to wrap, ratchet up if that's needed. Uh, Ukraine has also made a variety of requests for different types of aid, uh, and we're reviewing all of them to see uh, how we can further support uh, Ukraine in that regard as well. But none of that has actually seemed to deter President Putin from his uh, course. I mean, he's still doing exactly what he was doing, and if not, he's actually escalating, sending in truckloads of... Um, you know, equipment and stuff. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working, to be honest. Well, I, I will say that um, the impact on the economy is certainly working. So the question is, does President Putin care about the economy that is impacting people across his country, or does he care about continuing to take illegal actions in Ukraine? The impact is only going to increase over the course of time on his economy, both from steps we've already taken and steps we could certainly continue to take. But this is not only affecting the Russian economy, it's affecting the economies of emerging markets that are aligned with this kind of thing. You saw the currencies of, of a lot of emerging markets um, uh, fall today. Um, so it's not just that, surely the longer this escalates and the longer it drags on, um, it worsens it for everybody. So, you know, I mean, I know you're saying it's going to be discussed at NATO, 
but how quickly again you know how quickly do you want to see this resolved well certainly we wanted to see it resolved yesterday or long sure. before that um, and our preference is not to put new sanctions in place but uh, obviously what I mean by that is we'd prefer that Re that President Putin take de-escalatory actions and that uh, the Russians uh, take steps to uh, dial back what they've done over the course of the last several months. Uh, we're not uh, doing it just because putting new sanctions in place is a fun uh, effort. It's one that we feel is effective and will be effective over the short, medium, and long term. So that's why we continue to work with our European allies on it. I don't have any prediction on the timing because we typically don't predict those with that level of date, 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 days, and certainty. So what are you hoping to come from out of NATO that would change that? equilibrium. Well, there'll be a discussion there, which it's a rare opportunity to have a discussion with 28 countries uh, to talk about what should be done, uh, what are the tools that can be utilized, what should we do about the requests Ukraine has, uh, how do we address this moving forward. There are, for many of the points you referenced, there are concerns, of course, by all of these countries about what we can do from here, and uh, and that's what they'll discuss, and we'll see what comes out of it in a couple of days. The NATO chief uh, Phil Rasmussen is saying that um, one of the things that the alliance is going to endorse is an establishment of a force of several thousand troops, which would be like a rapid action force and could de be deployed within, deployed within a few days to meet any kind of perceived military mo movements by the Russians towards in into other places in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. it, um, is this something that the United States is supporting, and would there be any kind of United States involvement in this force of several thousand troops? Well, uh, we'll be discussing a range of issues uh, that look at the needs of NATO member states, including what we can do to deal with everything from hybrid warfare to other uh, different threats. Um, this will involve training exercises and discussions about infrastructure the alliance needs in the Baltics and Poland and Romania and other states on the eastern frontier uh, to deal with the world in which they face now. Uh, as you know, the president is uh, in Estonia or uh, will be on his way to Estonia soon. Um, we have Secretary Kerry, Secretary Hagel, and many other uh, administration officials have taken uh, trips to a number of NATO ally countries and off sometimes we've in introduced or in announced increased aid or assistance or military training or exercises. So there are a range of, uh, of discussion, there are a range of uh, components that will be discussed. So we could see some concrete pledges made by the President in Estonia. I don't want to get ahead of uh, the President of the United States. I just States. want to go, go back ahead. to your answer, I think, to a little while ago to mm -hmm. Leslie. Did you say we're not just imposing sanctions because it's some kind of a fun exercise? Yes, I did. You did? What, I mean, are you saying that it is a fun exercise as well I'm, as also a punishment for Crimea and for the... I'm saying uh, that we're skipping not through doing the tulips, it for the sake throwing of doing it. We think it's an right? impactful uh, okay. tool. And, but thus far, again, although officials in this building and Treasury and the White House mm -hmm. all speak about this damage that is supposedly being done to the Russian economy, it hasn't done anything that you want it to do in terms of de-escalating the situation in Ukraine. Is that correct? Well, Matt, I think there have been fits and starts of that, and there have been discussions uh, that have taken place at various times through the diplomatic uh, through diplomatic channels uh, with between Russia and Ukraine, with the separatists at times. As you know, there was a meeting just yesterday. Uh, but obviously, we feel that uh, continuing to put these consequences in place is necessary given right. the circumstances. But, ju but, but just in the, let's just take a time period of, let's say, the last week. All of the sanctions to date imposed by the, the United States and, the Euro and, and Europe and, and your other allies, the Japanese, the Australians, whoever else, have not made a, any difference in the Russian tactical or strategic uh, thinking as it relates to Ukraine, according to you, right? They have had an impact dramatically on the economy. No, no. That's not about going away. Obviously, this uh, situation will need to continue to be addressed in the coming days and weeks. So uh, we still feel this is an effective tool and one that uh, we will continue to consider additional okay, I actions just, on. I, I just I don't understand how we, it, it's effective if it's not producing the desired result, or not. In, in fact, the desired result is getting further away in your from what what you what you've because told Matt, us. Because the impact the, on the economy will only grow over the course of time as all of these uh, sanctions are imp are implemented. Right, but it's now been. I mean, when were the first sanctions were Im were imposed? Were was in after February, right? Or was, was, was it March? On right after the individuals, and they right. have increased. Right, right, the, right. The, and the, since then. Instead of withdrawing from Crimea, 
and reversing its annexation of Crimea, and instead of, according to you, withdrawing troops, or they put more troops in, they've done more to destabilize eastern Ukraine rather than less, and, you, and Crimea, the Crimea situation is still the same. So I don't understand by what calculus you're saying that the sanctions have been effective. Okay, sure, there might be some damage to the Russian economy right now, but that hasn't done what what it's uh, what you what you want it to do, which is to change the Russian actions. Is that isn't that not correct? Our view, Matt, is that that's a triple the negative. Impact, is that correct? Our view is that the impact on the Russian economy will only continue to increase while we've already seen a dramatic impact on both the capital flights on the economic growth projections, and we feel that will continue to have or will have an increasing impact on uh, the Russian uh, leadership. But, but, but it, an increasing impact, it doesn't seem to have had any impact at all so far. So it, an impact may be more. I mean, the capital flights and, the, and, and what you talk about, the growth, the negative growth projections, have not, have they yet, changed the calculus in Ukraine? Well, or there have, the there, as I referenced a few minutes ago, there have been fits and starts of discussions, of negotiations. Yes, but things right now, today, efforts. are demonstrably worse than they were a week ago. They're right? not certainly not where we want them to be, Matt. That's why right. we will continue to consider additional requests from the Ukrainian government, and while we'll continue to consult with our European counterparts on additional steps we can take. Just one more question on NATO. Go ahead. Uh, so we're not ruling out the idea that American troops could be included in the NATO Rapid Response Force that's going to include some 4,000 troops that was uh, debuted. I don't have anything more on that specific uh, announcement by NATO, and I'm sure there'll be more on the coming days. I'm not ruling anything in or out. Uh, can we go to the Palestinian? Sure. Uh, first of all, can you confirm whether uh, the Palestinian negotiator, Saeed Berka, actually is in town and meeting with the Secretary of State? I can, Saeed. Um, uh, Erekat and Faraj uh, will be in town tomorrow meeting with Secretary Kerry. Um, I'm not sure when they're arriving in town, um, so I'm not, and I'm not going to speculate on what issues they may or may not raise with the Secretary. Okay, now, Palestinian sources now. say that uh, Erekat is bringing with him a proposal, a request, or a demand, whatever you want to call it, uh, that there be some sort of a timetable to end the occupation. Would the United States of America support such a thing? Again, they can raise a range of issues that they're, uh, of course, that they would like to raise. That's why the Secretary is meeting with them. Our position hasn't changed on this. Uh, neither has it changed on our opposition to actions uh, by the Palestinians at the ICC. But you certainly believe that the sooner the occupation ends, the better, correct? Uh, well, Said, again, I think you're familiar with our right. positions on this. Nothing has changed, so go ahead. Uh, let me ask you about the settlement. You know, there was a, an mm -hmm. announcement on a huge settlement uh, this we weekend. We put out Just a to statement use, today. Yeah, you put out the statement, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, to use Matt's word, do you think that had some sort of an impact on the tactical and strategic thinking of the Israeli government or Mr. Netanyahu? Well, I can't speak to that, Said. I think, uh, obviously, the United States and Israel has an important strategic relationship, one that the United States values and one that Israel values. Mm -hmm. But it's important for us to also note when we have concerns about steps that are taken. Mm -hmm. What's your concerns that you expressed in, 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 your, in, in the statement that came out just before the briefing are, you know, uh, they're pretty much a standard recitation of, ev of, of what you say every time the Israelis um, announce new settlement construction or new construction in East Jerusalem or what, whatever, which, you know, the, frankly, over the years has lost, kind of lost track of the number of, you know, critical statements that the State Department has put out. What, is there any reason that this, this time it's going to be different? I mean, this is a, a, a pretty big swath of land, almost a thousand acres. Mm -hmm. Um, the Europeans have, you know, used a little bit stronger language, you know, in the roulette game of uh, which word do we use, condemn, deplore, we're deeply concerned, that kind of thing. Yours is a concern, or trouble, or whatever it was, concern. They use deplore. I'm just wondering what, you know, is, is there going to be any consequence to this if they keep continue to defy what you, what you think is not only what, what you want, but what you think is also best for a two-state solution, which is what everyone says they want. Well, one, um, Ambassador Shapiro uh, relayed our concerns over the weekend. Uh, Secretary Kerry is speaking with Prime Minister Netanyahu today, and certainly this will be a topic of discussion. Um, beyond that, I'm not going to, of course, read out our diplomatic engagement on issues like this. Um, 
I'm, I'm not, I think expressing our concern about actions that are taken is still an important uh, message that we're sending about how we view uh, these actions. Uh, in terms of uh, other components and the impact on a two-state solution, obviously two-state solution requires two parties to agree, and we're all familiar with the views of the Palestinians about this continued settlement activity and the impact it has on uh, their uh, interest in pursuing that. Well, do you believe that, that, that either the Israelis or the Palestinians at the moment have a, uh, a partner for peace? That either side does? Well, I think if both sides were willing to make the tough choices required, uh, that perhaps the negotiations would be ongoing. They're right, not, but, as you know. Okay, right so neither side is a partner for peace at the moment. Well, is there that, aren't active negotiations. All right, and you know, it has the, has the secretary actually already spoken to Prime Minister Netanyahu, or is that something that was supposed to be happening? It's planned for this afternoon. I don't have right. an exact time. Do, for do, it. do you have any reason to believe, based on the conversation that Ambassador Shapiro had and whatever other conversations there have had, you, the American officials have had with the Israelis, that they intend to do what you, or that they're even considering doing? what you want them to do, what you said in the statement, which is to reverse this decision? I'm not going to make a prediction of that, Matt. Do you, so you don't have any reason to believe I don't have any might. more to lay out for you in terms can of I their get, plans. I would point you to them. tomorrow with sure. the South <clears throat> Sure. Um, when was the last time that the Secretary met with any of the Palestinian negotiators or President Abbas? Was that the London meeting in uh, May? Uh, I'd have to check on that for you. Uh, Joe, I think it's been more recently than that. He's certainly spoken with a range of officials over the course of that time, but I can check for you over the summer. Okay, and who, who requested the meeting? Was it the Palestinians or was it the Secretary? I don't have other details on the Palestinians' meeting or visit to Washington and what else they'll be doing here. I can see if there's more we can lay out in that regard. Uh, do you know what the topic of the conversation, do you, can you tell us what the topic of the conversation is going to be? I think they'll talk about a range of issues. There's obviously an ongoing ceasefire uh, discussion and you know upcoming negotiations that will take place. There's a range of longer term issues, but beyond that, I don't have anything to predict and for you. Hanan Ashwari yesterday, one of the Palestinian negotiators, said uh, at the UN that um, the Palestinians are uh, picking up on Saeed's questions. The Palestinians are actually putting, trying to put forward a UN resolution um, to set a three year deadline to end the Israeli occupation. Um, she said for you that the United States will certainly veto it. Is, is that correct? Is she correct in her assumption that the United States would veto such a resolution? I think you're familiar with our history. I don't think anything will change in that regard. But a, a three-year deadline would be would give you three years to work out a comprehensive peace treaty, no? I think uh, we've our view has long been that there are a range of productive ways to have discussions about how to achieve a two-state solution, and typically that's not through international governing bodies. Yeah, you know, at a time when you are leading a posse, international policy to impose sanctions mm -hmm. on Russia, you know, for allegedly or invading Ukraine and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, we have an occupation that have gone on for a very long time, where the, you know, the occupying power keeps stealing land and building settlements and so on. Why can't you lead a posse to impose sanctions on Israel in this case? Wouldn't that make sense? That's not an option being considered. Why, why is it not an option? I why think is it I, not? Because Said, I think we need to move on because I don't have unlimited time well, here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Very briefly sure. about your statement. Right? So you said you're very concerned about the uh, possibility of new settlement in East Jerusalem construction, maybe it, that announcements may be, it come at any time. Can you be more specific? More, can you elaborate on that, or is that just something uh, that's kind of in the ether that you're concerned it's, about? It's, there have been news reports about it in the region, so that's why we addressed it. All right. And then you said that if the uh, appropriation in the West Bank and if these rumored or what reported new announcements uh, go ahead, it would send a very troubling message. Uh, it would send a very troubling message if they proceed. Mm -hmm. Is there any consequence to that well, if they proceed? I don't have any consequences to lay out for you, Matt. I think uh, it's important for us, uh, not just the United States, but there are a range of countries in the international community uh, that have been clear about not only their opposition, but uh, their own intentions. I'm not going to speak to those. I could speak for the United States. Uh, let's uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Elliot. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there are reports that Kang Suk Ju, who's the secretary of the Central Committee and uh, a former, uh, I guess, still current diplomat who was involved in missile negotiation and uh, nuclear negotiations, will be going to Europe. Um, are there any plans for him to meet with U.S. officials while he's there? I'd have to take that. I don't have any uh, okay. plans in front of me, but I'll ask our team and see. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, 
I just, sorry, I just have a couple more. Um, on Ri Su Yong, the foreign minister is scheduled to go to the UNGA this year. It's the first time in 15 years that a North Korean foreign minister will go. Do you have any confirmation or comment on that? I don't have any confirmation of it. Um, I, I will wait till there's confirmation before okay. we. Presum comment. Presumably, he would need to be granted a visa, so you'll know when the application is received and when it's granted. Yes. Which unlikely we wouldn't speak to, but okay. certainly those are things with anyone we would know okay. as the State Department. And then just finally on this, how do you see the, the aggressive sort of diplomacy that North Korea is embarking on taken together with reports of a, a secret visit by U.S. officials to North Korea earlier this month? Should we be, or last month now? Are you speaking to the interviews, or what are you speaking to specifically? There were, there were reports, and, and I don't think it's been confirmed, but there were reports that U.S. officials made a visit to North Korea um, to engage in talks with officials there. I don't have anything for you on that. Um, but taken together with these reports of, of North Korean officials interacting with Western governments, with Japan, supposedly with the U.S., it, do you see any kind of positive sign from that? Uh, none that I have to outline here. We have remaining concerns about the aggressive rhetoric and uh, tests by North Korea. Obviously, the ball remains in their court. That hasn't changed. Okay. Go ahead. Do you have anything regarding uh, the protest in Hong Kong against the Chinese ruling on the selection? Cool. Of Can we do one North Korean? We'll go right back to you. Go okay. ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. on North Korea. Sure. Um, beyond the what you said yesterday, do you have any more reaction to the the interviews that were carried out by CNN yesterday of the uh, three Americans being held in North Korea? Were, have you been in touch with the families? Were they in some ways relieved to at least see that their loved ones looked in reasonable health? Do you have any indications about whether they were uh, under any pressure, or whether they were reading from prepared statements? Uh, can you give us an evaluation? Um, well, we are in regular contact uh, with the families, and that has been the case long before this weekend, as has been our efforts uh, to um, do everything we can to bring uh, these three U.S. citizens detained in North Korea home. Uh, there's no greater priority to all to us than the welfare and safety of U.S. citizens abroad. Uh, so we will leave no stone unturned in that regard, uh, as has been the case uh, in this incident and unfortunately other incidents of Americans detained. Given our objective is uh, seeing them return home, we're not going to outline all of our efforts publicly or uh, analyze uh, media interviews uh, from here. And can I just ask, um, there was some issue um, a few weeks ago about whether your um, um, contact authority, sorry, that's not the right word, I can't think of it at the moment. Our protecting power? Your protecting power mm -hmm. um, um, had been in touch with uh, Jeffrey Fowler and Matthew Miller. Are you able to confirm whether they've had any consular visits from them yet? Um, I can. Um, the Embassy of Sweden, which is our protecting power, um, visited Mr. Fowl on June 20th, Mr. Miller on May 9th and June 21st, and Kenneth Bay 12 times since his detention, most recently on August 11th. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. GPRK, yeah. and then yes. we'll go. Just uh, two quick ones um, following up on. Joe's question. Um, so during the interview, these uh, detainees asked the U.S. government to send a um, high-ranking representative to negotiate the release, and the United States has proposed Ambassador King previously, which had been rejected. And I was wondering, do you have another representative in mind by any chance? I think as I said in response to Joe's question, obviously we're going to leave no stone unturned in doing everything we can to see these individuals return home. We're not going to outline all of our efforts uh, from here. Okay, and um, I'm sorry, one last question. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure if this is the visit that Elliot was re um, referring to, but U.S. officials visited Pyongyang in middle of August on a military aircraft, and I wondered if you could confirm that report, and if so, if you I could let us know what the objective is. I believe that report is what Elliot was asking about, asking but I don't have about? anything okay. for you on okay. that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. Hong Kong, I can just do a couple Japan. more here. Go ahead. Right. Um, Hong Kong? Do you have anything on the protest in Hong Kong against the Chinese ruling for the mm -hmm. uh, selection of the executive chief? I do. Um, I believe. Hold on one moment. Um, I believe I do. And if I don't have it in front of me, we will make sure we get it to you right after the briefing. Um, <clears throat> 
Uh, the United States supports uh, universal suffrage in Hong Kong in accordance with the basic law and the aspirations of the Hong Kong people. We believe that an open society with the highest possible degree of autonomy and governed by rule of law is essential for Hong Kong's stability and prosperity. And we believe that the legitimacy of the chief executive will be greatly enhanced if the basic law's ult ultimate aim of selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage is fulfilled. The great ally of the United States, Britain, has inquired a progress report on Hong Kong's political reform. Do you plan to follow suit of your ally? I'm sorry, who had requested that? Uh, Britain. Uh, the UK has, re UK has, has requested, requested of the United States? Uh, no, no, UK has inquired uh, a progress report on Hong Kong's political reform. Well, we've consistently raised our concerns. Obviously, we have a range of reporting mechanisms we do from here. I can check and see if that's something that we are also pursuing. How would you, um, how would you respond to the criticism from the Chinese government that the United States has no position to meddle in the domestic affairs? Well, certainly we wouldn't view it as meddling in domestic affairs. Obviously, it's up to the people of Hong Kong. That's how universal suffrage and voting works uh, to determine uh, their leadership, but um, we view uh, this as just uh, as a principle, uh, an important component of you know strengthening their society. Another related follow-up: the uh, Chinese policy toward Hong Kong is often seen as indication or has great uh, implication of Chinese policy toward Taiwan. As we were speaking, uh, I understand Deputy Secretary William Burns is meeting with the. Uh, Zhang Zhijun, who is the head of uh, China's Taiwan Affairs this afternoon. Do you have anything more to give substance on uh, that meeting? I don't have any details on that. We can see if there's more to convey to all of you on the, that meeting. Well, I believe so. I'd have to check. I don't have any confirmation. No, no, no I mean, you, have you seen him at all today? I have not seen him this morning. Okay. That's true. I will well, check it's and no see. no longer this. morning, so. Oh, sorry. This, I did not see him this morning or early afternoon. Okay, I have time for just a couple of more, so let's just do some. We, I think we've done a couple. Let's do, go ahead. Two quick ones. Um, sure. First of all, with Bahrain, the mm -hmm. foreign ministry is denying a U.S. report that a senior U.S. diplomat, Molinowski, who had been expelled, will be allowed to return to the country. Do you have any reaction? Well, um, I'd first note that Secretary Kerry and Bahraini Foreign Minister Khalifa agreed uh, on the importance of rescheduling this meeting during their July 14th call. Uh, and so we continue to work with the MFA in finding a mutually agreeable time. We've, of course, uh, seen the press release uh, by the MFA, but we're continuing to uh, work to reschedule the visit. And one more on a different topic, um, Cuba. Reschedule the visit. He was expelled and declared persona non grata. What is this rescheduling the meeting? Well, since he was there, and obviously he did not complete his visit, I think rescheduling is still the appropriate <coughs> He got thrown like out of the country. I'm familiar with the Which, events, and we obviously expressed concern I mean, about it them was at the like, time. Well, I understand that, but I mean, so uh, when you said the secretary and the foreign minister spoke about this, they said that they would un-PNG him and allow him back in? They would re they f discuss the they importance of rescheduling the Okay, visit. and still on Bahrain, do you have anything about the arrest of this human rights activist, this woman who um, uh, went, uh, went back and has now been thrown in jail? I do. Uh, we are concerned about uh, the arrest, uh, the reports of uh, the detention of Maryam al-Khawaja and are closely following developments, as we do with countries around the world. We urge the government of Bahrain to protect the universal rights of freedom of expression and assembly, uh, just as we urge all elements of Bahraini society to engage in peaceful expressions of political opinion. Uh, the government of Bahrain must abide by its obligations to respect freedom of expression and assembly, and we again urge the government to take steps to build confidence across Bahraini well, society. Well, given just these two cases, the one with um, your assistant secretary uh, and, um, and, and this woman, how, how is the government of Bahrain doing on its uh, – commitment to upholding universal values? Well, we have consistently said the government of Bahrain must do more to meet its own commitments to reform, uh, and right. certainly rescheduling the visit is only a component of that. Uh, obviously, uh, as we have concerns, as is the case of this arrest, we will express Okay, that. they must do more, and rescheduling the visit is a, a the Malinowski visit is a component of that. What well, about I the think broadly speaking, not just this. Well, what about the release of the 
Well, certainly, I think uh, when in, when we express concerns about individuals who are detained, I think it, right. it is a evidence of our. And, and just the, the or what? They well, must do more, and if they don't, what are you going to? What is the U.S. going to do about it? Well, Matt, I know you're on a big consequences theme today, but mm -hmm. I think there are times Truth where you can work through diplomatic channels to uh, convey when things there is more that needs to be done, and sometimes you can successfully. Uh, yeah. accomplish that. But just to be crystal clear, by saying they uh, talked about the importance of rescheduling the visit, your understanding is that uh, he will be, Malinowski will be allowed into Bahrain when he goes next time? Well, certainly I think when you discuss that with a counterpart of another country and there's agreement on that, that is the assumption. So yes. the agreement is he can go back? I think the agreement is rescheduling it and all the things that requires is an, it was impor is an important thing and that was part of their call in July. Uh, okay, let's do three more here. Go ahead. Uh, uh, let's just do people who haven't uh, we haven't done to. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I think uh, the young the young lady in front of you. Ladies first. Go ahead. I'm Saudi Arabia. Um, yes. Saudi Arabia has arrested 88 people accused of plotting attacks inside and outside the country. Can you comment on that? I I think uh, we'd have to I'd have to look at the details of those arrests. Um, let me do that and we can see if we can, can get you your comment. Can you comment on counterterrorism efforts within the region? Well, certainly part of our effort to build this international coalition, which Saudi Arabia is in sport, certainly sorry, an important partner in that, is to address uh, threats uh, where they are and where they're coming from. And uh, certainly we've seen, well, in the United States, it's up to 100 uh, individuals uh, with passports that we have concerns about. There are greater numbers when it comes to some of the European countries. And I think many countries in the region are trying to take on this threat, and we're working with them to do just that. Sorry, Jim. Yes. Uh, the Saudis also sentenced uh, a human rights activist, Ra'if al-Bedawi, for 100 lashes or 1,000 lashes plus two years in, in prison for criticizing the virtue police. Do you have anything to say I on that? I think you're talking about two very different things, Saeed, but, but we can get you a comment on that after the briefing. Yeah. Let's just do uh, two more here. Go ahead in the back. The situation in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, today, opposition parties in the parliament, they got together and they said that they will, they will back the prime minister and they will resist any move to remove him through violent or extra constitutional measures. Uh, your comments on that. And also, the former U.S. ambassador to Islamabad, Ambassador Munter, said that he believed if there is a military coup, uh, the U.S. will san impose sanctions on Pakistan. So also your comments on that. Well, uh, I think, one, we've obviously been closely watching the situation in Pakistan and we've been in touch with uh, appropriate counterparts there. Um, I don't have any predictions for you on an outcome. Uh, we typically do not do that. But I will just uh, reiterate that we're in no way involved in the process uh, or discussion between parties uh, and can offer no real analysis uh, of, uh, of, of what's happening there uh, beyond uh, just reiterating our belief that the parties should work together to resolve differences through peaceful dialogue and ways to strengthen Pakistan's democracy uh, and rule of law. Uh, about I, I have the same question on this. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, this is Janazeb Ali from ARY TV Pakistan. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are two reports that uh, ISS uh, distributing pamphlets and brochures in Pakistan, asking people to join them and uh, start campaigning against the Shia community in Pakistan. So what uh, really United States is doing to prevent the expansion of this terrorist organization? And, and second question is about the uh, closure of uh, U.S. embassy in Islamabad. How long can be closed? Well, um, I don't have any prediction for you on um, the second question. Obviously, there are steps that we take as the United States government uh, in order to ensure the security and safety of our personnel. Uh, we make every effort to reopen or make services available as soon as we possibly can because that's an important role that we can play around the world. What was your first question again? Can you just repeat it again? Sorry. Uh, yes, I yell. ISS about distributing brochures in Pakistan, well, asking people to join. I don't have any support. confirmation of this. Obviously, uh, I'm sure you're watching uh, events like this closely. I think, again, part of our effort underway is not limited to a specific part of the world to take on this threat. That's why the Secretary is speaking to a range of counterparts, not just in countries that are um, directly next to um, uh, Iraq or Syria, but countries that are around the world that may be uh, concerned about the threat that ISIL is posing. But can you be a little more expensive on, uh, uh, a little more on what you said? C can you say that you will oppose any means to change the government through violent means or uh, military coup? I don't think it? I'm going to add to what I just said. Okay, let's just do two more here. Go ahead. Uh, just 
Ken, uh, do you have any comment on Prime Minister Abe's uh, plan to shake up his cabinet? Uh, I don't think uh, we do from here. Uh, often those are domestic issues that are dealt with from country to country. If there's more, I'm sure we can follow up directly with you okay, following the great. briefing. Right, thank you. Okay. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Over the weekend, uh, some pu publication in Germany show, uh, and pu uh, published some documents that the American NSA have been eavesdropping on Turkey for years now. Uh, and there are many details in it. Is there any way you can uh, comment on that? Uh, as a matter of policy, we don't comment publicly on alleged intelligence activities. I can confirm for you that we have discussed these uh, allegations with Turkish officials. Um, as a friend and ally of Turkey, we remain committed to strengthening our close partnership and, uh, and continuing our cooperation in key areas, and uh, certainly that discussion will continue. As you mentioned, uh, American D a DCM in Ankara, Mr. Bailey, was invited to Turkish Foreign Ministry. And uh, Turkish uh, Deputy Foreign uh, uh, Prime Minister said that U.S. is expected to, to investigate and end its activities directed at our uh, state. Uh, would you able to promise that if these allegations are true, uh, is the, U the U.S. government is going to end its activities on Turkey? I would point you to uh, the President's uh, speech earlier this year uh, where he talked about our own efforts to review uh, our intelligence gathering. Uh, he announced a series of reforms. I don't have anything more than that to offer to you. Uh, one last question. On, on, on the inauguration, mm -hmm. the, uh, has, do you know it was a relatively, it was a, not relatively, it was an extremely small delegation of one person to go to President Erdogan's uh, swearing in ceremony. Do you know if there's been any contact between uh, Washington and, um, and his administration since then? Uh, well, certainly we've been in contact with the Turkish government, absolutely, right. uh, on the, the ground. The, through our the charge, your charge has been the same person who led the delegation. Well, if the United States I'm Senate would like to confirm on our him, ambassador, just, he could have also attended. Fair enough, but I'm just wondering if has there been any discussion between the U.S. U.S. officials and Turkish officials from U.S. officials here in Washington since the charge went to the inauguration and then got hauled into the foreign ministry to talk about these espionage allegations. Uh, from the State Department building, uh, there is Specifically, has Secretary Kerry talked Secretary to Secretary Kerry has not spoken with his counterpart since then. Okay, one more. I think we have to finish it off right here. Go ahead. The Secretary is meeting with um, Panama's Vice President. Um, Panama recently extended an invitation to Cuba to attend the America's Summit in 2015, and this is the first such invitation for Cuba in a number of years. Does the State Department have any response? Well, as I understand it, it was an announcement of intention to invite. Um, I would refer you to the government of Panama for any questions regarding formal invitations. Um, we, uh, from here, uh, our view is that at the 2001 Summit of the Americas, all participating governments agreed to consensus that, quote, the maintenance and strengthening of the rule of law and strict respect for the democratic system are at the same time a goal and a shared commitment and are an essential condition of our presence at this and future summits. Uh, so we should not undermine commitments previously made, uh, but should instead encourage, and this is certainly our effort, the democratic changes necessary for Cuba to meet the basic qualifications. But of course we look forward to the day when all 35 countries in the uh, region can participate in the summit process. Okay, thanks everyone.